Thank you so much. I must confess, every time I hear such wonderful introductions, I hope my mom and dad was in the audience. Because my dad would be very proud and my mom will actually believe everything she said. <laughs> right? That's how moms are, right? Moms are like, you know, my mom still thinks I can solve all the problems. I say, no, mom, that doesn't happen that way. And my dad is still collecting newspapers and magazines where my articles come. But that's the incredible blessings of parents that we have. And I always say a lot of what I've been able to do has been nothing but a series of coincidences. And I think we are all players in a series of coincidences. And what I'm going to share in the next 45 minutes is some of these series of coincidences. And I don't take any credit for all the good things that was told about me. I think we are all just players in what I see as a series of coincidences. What I want to do in the next 45 minutes is just tell you some stories. Right? Some stories and make some and break some myth. I want to break some myths about common perceptions that we have. And finally, I'll talk about inclusive leadership. And I was hearing what Rajiv was talking about. It's very similar to open source leadership, but coming from a completely different direction. And you, at the end of it, can judge whether we are talking about the same thing or different things. We're probably coming from two different directions, talking about exactly the same thing. Um, so what I want in the next 45 minutes from you is if you can give me your undivided attention. And there is a lot of studies which shows that human beings now have an attention span smaller than a goldfish, which is less than eight seconds. So <laughs> that's scientifically proven, thanks to our telephone. So you can leave your phones behind, right? Um, you don't have to take notes, because Rajiv promised me that all the content will be available online. Uh, I'm happy to share my presentations to you, all of you. So don't worry about taking notes. Keep that aside, and I want to break some very fundamental myths and give you some few takeaways of how to become an inclusive leadership or an inclusive leader. Let me first start by sharing a personal story of mine. And I'll do a lot of personal stories, uh, mix it with uh, some data and statistics that is out there in the public domain. So I was the head of SAP Labs in India uh, in 2010. Uh, and I was responsible. I was one of the youngest CEOs of a global multinational in India at around 5,000 engineers based out of our Bangalore campus. Uh, so if you've been to Bangalore, SAP has a huge campus, 25 acres of land. We literally have everything in that campus so employees can really work hard and, and produce the desired outcomes. What is interesting, if you know Bangalore, is that we have a heavy problem of power shortages. And if you are in the tech industry, you obviously need to have power 24 by 7 because employees are all the time working. You can't, your servers can't go down. So what we do is we generate our own power. So almost all the big companies we have, which have a campus they generate their own power within the campus. So there's a big power generation capacity within the campus. So I was taking a round of the campus once with my head of facilities. He took me to the power generation room, and he showed me what is happening. You know, there are people taking the readings, um, and they, he explained me how it works. And you know, everything looked good. And then at the end of it, he said, Feroz, we have a problem. And I said, what is the problem? He said, nobody wants to work here. And I'm like, why? what's wrong? Why don't people want to work here? He said, every time we hire people, they leave after three to four months. And then I asked him, why do they leave? They said, you know, it's a very loud and noisy place. It's a very loud and noisy place. And people have problems if they sit in that room for too long. And so they leave. And this kind of was there at the back of my head. I didn't know what to do with that. You know, what can you do? How do you make it, you know? Noise proof, we thought about it, didn't have a solution. Until I bumped into my friend accidentally, and I told him the same thing. I said, you know what, we have this problem, I don't know what to do with this. And he said something which was an absolute aha moment. He said, Feroz, hire deaf people. <laughs> and I'm like, holy shit, how didn't I see this? So we went ahead, hired people who were deaf and mute. We trained them for a few days. It was not rocket science, by the way. They had the basic education. They, didn't, they knew how to take the readings. They had to do certain basic functions when power went off. We could train them very easily. The good news is they never left SAP since then. <laughs> so 
I've always been thinking, why didn't I see this problem? And by the way, it's not just me. Every company that is in the Whitefield area in Bangalore, whether are, which is called the Silicon Valley of, of, uh, of India, has the same problem. And nobody is thinking about this as a solution. They go and hire the same set of people again and do the same mistakes over and over again. And I'm like, why don't people see these solutions which are right in front of them, which makes absolute business sense because it's good for the business, it's good for the individual. Everybody has a win-win situation. And that got me thinking, and I actually did a lot of research in the last six, seven years, and I realized that the best solutions actually are not when we are seeing things the way we want to see. It's actually in outside the systems. There's a beautiful saying that when everybody is thinking the same, nobody's thinking. Now let me give you two or three examples from history. How many of you watched the Olympics in 2016 in Rio? You would have at least watched some highlights, right? Some Olympics sometimes, you, I'm sure you would have watched. Can you just raise your hands? I just want to do this as a test. At least you know what an Olympics is, right? <laughs> Great. So uh, we got the first thing right. So Olympics happens every four years, and you know that, right? I was just joking. How many of you watched the Paralympics? Now, this is the same response I get across the world. People don't watch Paralympics. But if you really want to know the human spirit, watch Paralympics. And Paralympics will do you things that you would never imagine. And let me give you something very interesting that happened in Paralympics in 2016, which people don't know about. The top four people who finished in the 1500 meters race in the T13 category ran faster than the gold medal winner in the regular Olympics. Do you know that? The top four guys who finished first, second, third, fourth, ran faster than the normal people who ran the 1500 meters race. And I'm like, really? And nobody knew about this? Nobody wrote about this? Of course, a few people wrote, but nobody understood it. Now, the problem is the following. The people in the T13 category are visually impaired. So I was like, if they can run faster than the normal people, they should be running the normal Olympics. Right? I mean, that makes sense. But they're not allowed to because they are visually impaired and they, they have to go in circles and they don't know how to go in circles along with regular people. Whose problem is this? <laughs> Very interestingly, I met the national coach, Satya Narayana, who's, who's an amazing guy. He's coached the, almost all the medal winners in India. I met him last year. He had come for the Inclusion Summit and he said something very interesting. He said, Firoz, I have a guy who can actually win the gold medal in the 800 meter race, but the problem is I don't have a runner who's faster than him. So just to explain how it works, so if you're visually challenged and if you have to run the circle, you need to have a buddy who runs ahead of you and they have a small rope which ties to the waist of the runner, so they are running in front of you. That is how the visually impaired people run. Now the problem is if you are a very good runner, you need a buddy who's faster than you. So he said, sir, I have a problem. This guy can win the gold medal in 800 meters, but there is nobody who can run faster than him, so I'm putting him in a different category. <laughs> I'm like, we have a fundamental problem. We hosted a wrestler, his name is Gunga Pehlwan, incredible guy. He's deaf and mute. He is actually as good or even better than the national champion, which is Sushil Kumar, who went on to win two medals in Olympics. He's actually good or better than him, but he's not allowed to go to the Olympics because he's deaf and mute, and every time the referee whistles, he can't hear. I'm like, is that a problem? That's easy to fix. I mean, I'm a technologist. I can just put a button and he gets a shock and he knows when to stop. <laughs> I mean... But nobody cares a damn to fix this problem because Paralympics is not interesting. There's no money, nobody cares. This is the sad state of affairs. If anybody tells me that people with disabilities are less able than others, I can prove it's completely wrong. The mistake is in our side to not to see their abilities. The second thing I want to share. You know, I wrote this book called Gifted uh, three years back. Because I was inspired by the stories of people who came and spoke at the summit. These were incredible people. 
So I said, their stories need to be told. So I wrote about these 15 incredible people, but no publisher wanted to publish it. Because they said, Firoz, why, you know, there is no market for stories about people with disabilities. It's not viable. They said, we've written two or three books, but you know, nobody reads it, so it's a losing proposition. He said, come back when you write a better and a more viable book. And I'm like, but there is a problem. Why do you say it is not viable? It's exactly wrong. It is statistically proven this is wrong. And let me share how I can prove that. The United Nations says that between 10 to 15% of the world's population have people with disabilities. 10 to 15%. And this is the standard set of disabilities, or deaf, blind, autism, and so on. So they have 10 to 15% is a rough number. Every person with disability impacts at least four, if not five, family members. I have a son, I know it impacts me and my wife and my parents and my in-laws. Minimum, it impacts four to five people, minimum. So actually, 60% of the world's population, at a bare minimum, is impacted by having somebody either personally disabled or has a direct impact on your life. Why do you say it's not a viable space? I just don't understand. So I told them, Let's look at popular mediums like movies. All of you watch movies, right? I hope some of you watch Hollywood movies. There is an interesting case that happened. In 1988, there was a movie called Rain Man, where Dustin Hoffman played the role of an autistic person that was considered a tipping point in spreading awareness about autism in the US and the rest of the world. Everybody knows that he went on to win the Oscar award. What people don't know is the following that 14 out of the 27 Best Actor Awards since Dustin Hoffman played that role has been played by people with disabilities. 14 out of the 27 Best Actor roles that went on to win Oscar awards have played the role of either a person with disability or having some form of illness. So people love to hear that story. It's clear. These are all blockbusters and you know, went on to win Oscar awards. So I told a lot of my publishers, I think there is a space for it. I don't believe there is nobody wants to listen to that. If that's the case, then this wouldn't happen. Then, so of course, some of them asked me some questions like, OK, uh, do you have any rock stars in the book? I said, no. Then they asked me, do you, have, does, would you, do you think this book will sell in the airport? I said, no chance. Right? <laughs> then they asked me, does it have any sex in it? I said, no, not at all. <laughs> then they said, why should I publish this? Right? And I'm like, you should publish it because one inherent thing that everybody needs in the world is hope. And this book is all about hope. They said, it doesn't matter if it all sounds good, but nobody's going to read it anyway. We turned it around. We put the book in hospitals. Because that is one place where anybody who gets in needs hope. In three weeks, it became a bestseller. It's now been translated into three languages, three more languages next year. It's sold by word of mouth. And the interesting thing is the title is called Gifted, so everybody started gifting it to their friends and family. They bought 20 copies and gifted it to people. So if there is a narrative that people with disability stories are not viable, completely wrong. So that's the second myth that I want to break. The third myth that I want to break is that it does not make business sense. I've been told this many times. So this is all good, but it doesn't make business sense. We, are in, you know, we have to make money. This is all doesn't make sense. And I'll go back to Rajiv's video. He showed a video of Satya Nadella, right? Now let me tell the different side of the story. He wrote this book, Reset. Some of you can read it. He actually, for the first time, told he has three children. His eldest son has profound disability. His eldest son has cerebral palsy, profound disability. And out of his other two children, one of them has learning disability. So th two out of his three children have, learned, have disabilities of some form or the other. And here is what is even more powerful that he said. Rajiv said that Satya probably has done the greatest turnaround in the tech industry in the last 10 years. And he said, for the first time, Microsoft has become an empathetic company. And he says, I've learned empathy from my son who's disabled. And he says, for better or for worse, the character of a leader becomes the character of the organization. 
How do you measure the impact of that child? This is a billion dollar company. Let me give you another insight. I was in Spain two weeks back, and I was meeting the CEO of a company called Onsa. This is one of the largest Spanish companies, ONCE, and there's a case study around them. 35,000 employees, 40% of the people are visually impaired. It's a company started in 1937. I met the CEOs, and what he told blew my head off. It's the only country in the world where unemployment rate is 18 to 19 percent, but the unemployment rate of visually impaired person is 9 percent. It's the only country in the world where if you are visually impaired, you will actually earn more money than a sighted person. <coughs> only country in the world. What does it prove? That if you have a system in place to include people with disabilities, they can not only do as better, good, but even better than others. It makes complete sense. Most people don't get it because they are blinded by bias. Let me give you another interesting statistic. Every company worth is salt, and Raji will tell me this. They have something called diversity and inclusion training. So it's become very fashionable to do that, by the way. Everybody does it. Nothing against these trainings, but there is enough evidence to show that none of these trainings either make the company diverse or nor more inclusive. And there is a reason for that, and the reason is you are biased in a certain way, and it's very difficult to overcome those biases. You go to a training, you understand it, you come back and behave exactly the same way because you've been wired in a certain way and you have those biases which are extremely deep-rooted. Now the question is, how do you design to overcome these biases? And it can be designed, but people are not thinking from a design perspective. Let me give you an example. In the 1970s, in the US, the top orchestras in the United States, when they looked at it, they found that only 5% of the people in the top orchestras were women, 5%. There is no proof to show that women cannot be good musicians. So they asked, why is it that only 5% of the top musicians in the orchestras are women? Exactly after two decades, in the 1990s, that number became 35% in two decades. You know what happened? Any guesses what really happened in those two decades? It's not that more women started playing music. It's not that women started suddenly becoming better musicians. There was just one design change that the top orchestras did. Just one simple design change. They did blind auditions. Every time you select anybody, the person has to perform be, be, beside, behind a curtain, so you don't know whether the performance is given by a man or a female. You select people on the basis of the music. Two things happened. The number of women in music increased, and the quality of the music improved as well. This can never have been done by doing more women, sending more people or more women to training programs. Not possible. Because human beings have a bias. And there are many design principles that can be applied to overcome these biases. At SAP, for example, we say, you know, when you get a resume, we don't know whether it's a male or a female. We don't even know what their names are, so you don't know what ethnicity. We are just looking at their skills. And I tell this to HR people across the world. That's the first thing you should do, not to send them on more trainings. Because human beings are biased. As soon as you see a woman has applied who's at between 30 to 35, in your mind you're like, okay, how long will they stay? Remove those biases. You can design your systems to overcome these biases. Does that make sense? Now let me tell you a few insights about my personal journey, and then I will share some takeaways from my own journey in the inclusion space. So a lot of it started in 2010. 2010 was, was a great year for me. You know, I was the head of SAP. I was one of the youngest uh, chief executives of a global multinational in India. 
And, uh, you know, I had married my college sweetheart, so that was good. Um, she was a Hindu and I was a Muslim. Um, that was a perfect recipe for disaster. <laughs> um, we still got married. It took us 10 years, but, you know, we fought it out and uh, we got married. So life was as good as it can get. Your career is going in the right direction. You married your college sweetheart. I had my, f my kid, Vivan, and I was like, this is incredible stuff, right? And you kind of become a little arrogant about stuff, right? I mean, you think you have complete control over stuff. And then I was completely blindsided one day when I was going for, I went for a dinner with my boss. Um, and after the dinner, my boss called me in one corner and I, he said, Firoz, uh, I think your son has a problem. And I was not amused when somebody tells you that, right? I mean, my son was incredibly good looking. And uh, I think that's what every parent says, right? Um, but, you know, I was like, he's, he looks fine. He's 18 months, like all his development goals have been met. So I don't see a problem here. And he said, no, I think he's not making eye contact. Why don't you check him out? I said, so what if he doesn't make eye contact? He said, no, no, I think maybe you should check out if he's on the autism spectrum. I went back home. I had no clue what to do, so I reached out to Dr. Google. So, uh, Dr. Google, can you tell me what is autism, right? So that's the first thing all of us do today, right? There's a reason why our attention span is less than eight seconds, because we think we can know everything in that much time, right? So I went and said, what is autism? So I, got, I read a little bit of literature about it. And then I said, what are the signs of autism at 18 months? And it gave us through some 10 signs. The first one was, uh, they don't make eye contact. And I was like, yeah, he doesn't. They don't respond to names. And I'm like, yeah, he's right. Every time I call him Vivan, he doesn't respond. So yeah, that seems like a problem. Um, then they do the same things over and over again. And he was watching the same video since he was born. The same video, all the time, right? So he was doing that. Uh, he sometimes used to walk on his toes. I'm like, yeah, he does that. He's non-social, so as soon as people come home, he wants to kind of go in one corner, completely non-social. I'm like, yeah, that seems like a problem. And in my mind, my heart sank, and I'm like, I think he has a problem. So I convinced my wife, and we both went to a doctor. And that started going downhill after that. You know, it took me months before finally a doctor called me after two to three months because we did multiple tests. He called me to his room, so it was me and my wife, and my son was and my wife was holding my son. And uh, the doctor said, I think your son is autistic. Um, you should start on some kind of therapies. And, and, and none of us knew what to do. I didn't look at my wife. She didn't look at me. We went back home, drove in a car with complete silence with my son sitting behind. And we had no clue what hit us. So I you know, went home. I didn't want to show my angst to my wife. So I went into the bathroom, locked myself, and cried for straight 30 minutes. And I was like, there goes my perfect life. And um, if any of you have gone through this phase, you will realize there are different phases of it. The first phase is denial. Okay? Why did it happen to me? I didn't do anything wrong. I thought I was living a perfect, you know, good life, good human being. My mom told me nothing wrong can happen to you because you're a nice human being. And I'm like, yeah, but it doesn't seem like, it, doesn't, it kind of doesn't add up. So you first go through the denial phase, then you go through a depression phase, right? You don't know what to do, you know, what hit you, because there is no end to this. This is not like you give, you have a cure for this. This is going to be a lifelong journey. So I didn't know what to do with that. I, I went under severe, you know, kind of a shell. It was not showing up in office. If I was, I didn't know what to do. I didn't share it with anybody. And then an incredible thing happened. Uh, one of my mentors is Dr. Kiran Bedi, who incidentally happens to be a speaker here, I think two or three years back, and I've known her for many years. Uh, she's been an incredible champion. Uh, we've been working for many years on many of her social missions, and she calls me her son. I'm very proud of the fact that she thinks I'm a son, and Vivan is his grandson. So she called me and said, Firoz, why haven't you called me for a month? And I told about Vivan. I said, you know, he's been diagnosed with autism. I don't know what to do. At that moment, she told me something that changed my life forever. She said, most people in the world spend their entire lifetime not knowing what their purpose is. You're incredibly fortunate that the purpose found you.
You are fortunate because you have the means, you have the intellect, you have the network to not just make a difference to your own son, Vivan, but hundreds and thousands of others who are not so fortunate. Take this as your purpose of life. And that moment was like a switch in my head, you know, it's like in one mode to the other mode. The next day, I went to office, shared it with all my colleagues and said, you know, this is what it is. I have no clue what to do. Everybody said, you know what, we will we'll get on to this journey. We have, none of us know what to do. We are not doctors, so we can't cure it. But maybe we are technologists, and maybe the solution lies in technology. Let's figure it out. We had no clue where to start. But the first thing we did was on weekends, on Saturdays and Sundays, when the office is empty, we invited a lot of parents of people on the autism spectrum. We said, you know what, we have free space. You know, it's empty. So let's call them and listen to what their concerns are. If you don't know what the problem is, let's figure out the problem. Let's not try to solve, the, solve it right now. Let's figure out the problem. We spoke to a lot of parents, and everybody had one concern, just one concern. I said, if there's one concern, what is it? They all said, we don't know what to do with our children after we are gone. Because it's not a physical disability where you can probably have a prosthetics or something and you, you can get on. But if you're intellectual disability, you are almost always dependent on somebody else. And the parents always said, we don't know what to do after we are gone. And the thing that broke my heart is when one of the parents came and told me, Feroz, you know what? My wish is to live one more day than my child. And that broke my heart. I said, how many parents in the world would wish that? And I said, you know what? We have to do something about it. You can't live this problem for somebody else to solve. And while doing a lot of research, one of the things that I bumped into was an interesting guy called Thorkel Sonner. He was a Danish entrepreneur. He had the same problem. He had a child on the autism spectrum. Everybody told him that, you know what, he has to sit at home, he can't do much, or you have to put him in assisted living. And the fundamental problem was People on the autism spectrum couldn't be independent because they couldn't find a job. And the reason they couldn't find a job, when you go a little bit deeper, is that the recruitment systems are completely flawed. Because the recruitment systems look at two basic capabilities in every job in the world. Team player and good communication skills. Right? Tell me a, a role which doesn't need that. Probably every job will say you need to be a team player and you need to have good communication skills. Two skills that people on the autism spectrum never have. So they never get a job. People have double PhDs from the best colleges in the world never get a job because they can't do these two things. And so Thorkel Son, the entrepreneur, he said, you know what? If nobody does it, I'm going to start my own company and hire people on the autism spectrum because I'm not going to look at what they're not good at. I'm going to look at what are they good at. And he said they're good at two things. They have, many of them have photographic memory because they see the world in pictures. So they can look at this crowd and it's like taking a picture and it's stored in their mind and they can reprocess it and say, you were here on this date on this particular time because they see the world in pictures. Many of them have good photographic memories. Not all of them, many of them. The other interesting thing was they could do the same things over and over again without getting bored. So they said, instead of finding a job for them, we will find a job that fits into their strengths, not the other way around. So he was a tech guy, and he said in the tech world, there was one particular role which needed that skills, and that was the testing job. You know, if you've been a tester, sometimes you have complex steps, right? There are many steps involved. You have to set up your parameters, your systems, and if anybody has worked in SAP, you know it's a long, complex process. And you also know that you have to do the same thing over and over again until it's 100% proven, which can sometimes be very boring for neurotypical people. He said, let me try if these things work. In the end, he created a company with 100 employees, 80 of them were people on the autism spectrum, and he made profits. It was not a social CSR activity. It was making business profits. Me and my chief of staff at that time, we flew down to Denmark over a weekend, and we said, let's figure out what this guy is doing. We spent two full days with them, understood what they were doing. I came back to Bangalore, and I said, you know what? I have a team of 500 testers in the company. Out of my 4,000 people, one of the largest team was a team of testing. 
And I said, maybe let's try hiring a few people who can do this job, who are on the autism spectrum. We hired four people, but the problem was none of them had a college degree. I mean, there was no college. In, SA, in, in, in India, autism was not even considered a disability, so there was no college that they could go through. They only went up to 10th or 12th. They knew how to browse the internet, but we trained them for six months, and then we put them into the system. After one and a half years, we proved that the outcome of the people on the autism spectrum are better than the regular engineers. But what was even more interesting was the following. The managers in the teams came and said, you know, Firoz, these guys are so incredible that they have brought the team together. Everybody started owning the people as if it's their own kids. These people had buddies in the office because they couldn't take care of their own. And people used to come and tell me sometimes, Firoz, you know what, I have three kids at home and one in office. The compassion and the engagement level of the teams increased. What was even more powerful was they came and said, Firoz, you know what? These people never lie. They never ask for a salary hike. <laughs> they never ask for promotions. And they want to work on weekends. They don't understand. The mothers started calling me and said, you know what? They're troubling me. They want to go to office on a Saturday and Sunday. They don't understand that. Why should you not work on a Saturday, Sunday? They don't get it. So here is the problem that I want to tell you. Why is it that people who have good attitude, who can perform better than other engineers, why don't we hire them? It just doesn't make sense. And this is where a series of coincidences happened. Forbes art carried an article called Everybody is Good at some Something. If you do a Google, it's called How Autistic Strammed at SAP Labs. The journalist interviewed me, and he carried my entire interview verbatim. That went viral. I was selected as a young global leader in 2012, and I was invited to Davos to speak about an idea that can change the world. So you get five minutes. You just get five minutes. And I can tell you that's the most difficult speech I ever made. Longer speeches are easier. The shorter ones, like four and a half minutes, you have to give your idea, and you have the world as your audience. CNN carried my entire speech verbatim the next day. It somehow landed up in the co-CEO's ear at SAP, who was also in Davos. So the two CEOs of SAP were in Davos. They called me for a breakfast meeting, then they said, did you do this? And I'm like, yeah, I've been doing it for now like one and a half years. I didn't tell anybody, I just did it. But I think that's the greatness of the insight of leaders. They immediately understood that this was something incredibly powerful. And they said, what percentage of the people are on the autism spectrum? I said, 1%. And they said, if you can do this in the most difficult place that is India, where there is a taboo, where there are no education systems, I think it can be done everywhere in the world. And I'm like, yeah, it can be done. From my speech in January to making SAP making a bold commitment in the month of July in the largest technology event that SAP ever does called Sapphire. 25,000 people attend physically the event. It is the largest tech event that SAP does. 25,000 people, they said, we will make an announcement that we will hire 1% of our global workforce with people on the autism spectrum because it makes business sense. This is not charity. It makes business sense to do it. So I wrote, and the problem was nobody knew what to write in the press brief, right? Because nobody has done this. So they said, Firoz, why don't you write the press brief? So me and my assistant typed the press release. The funny thing was my assistant was asking, Firoz, are you sure this is 1% or is it 0.1%, right? <laughs> I mean, things can go big time wrong, right? <laughs> and I'm like, don't ask. Yes, Just write 1%, right? <laughs> We made the announcement at Sapphire on, I think it was a Wednesday or a Thursday. Because we didn't expect anybody to cover that story. Because it was, you know, it's an HR story, it's an autism story. This is a tech event. People want to know, know about cool apps and new, next big enterprise and machine learning and so on. Who wants to know about autism? So we wrote it anyway. On Saturday, I got a call from the chief diversity and inclusion officer saying that, Firoz, the phone has not stopped ringing. 
Till date, it has received more than 3,000 unique media stories across the world. It's the most covered story in SAP's 46-year-old history, more than any product launches put together. In 2016, in April, it became an official Harvard case study. In 2016, on 2nd of April, which is the World Autism Awareness Day, Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the United Nations, invited SAP and asked us that every corporate should make similar commitments. Because it does multiple things. The first thing is it gets people off unemployment, so the government doesn't have to pay people for being unemployed. That's the first thing it does. The second thing is it makes business sense. So the, for the companies, it's very good. And the third and the most important is it gives, it gives dignity to people. It's not about money. It's telling people that everybody is good at something. And we provide you value, and we provide you dignity. And since then, IBM, HP, Ernst & Young, across all companies have made similar commitments saying that we are going to hire people on the spectrum because they're good for it. And I remember when I was typing the press release, my assistant said, Firoz, do you know what Vivan has done? One person. It's not just created 650 jobs because we were 65,000 employees at that point in time, and 1% was 650 jobs. He said it's unleashed a movement across the world. But the problem is people always come and ask me, Firoz, can you show me the business plan? <laughs> How did you do this? What was the business plan? I said, if I had a business plan, it wouldn't have even started. No chance. People don't get this. And so I was trying to understand it myself because I think it was a series of accidents. I was like, how, did, how the hell did this happen? You know, it was a weekend project. Four years, it's become a global movement. And I don't take any credit for this. So I've been speaking to a lot of thought leaders across the world saying, how does large-scale transformations happen? How does movements happen? I've studied Gandhiji's Dandi March, which is very famous about how, how to build a movement. How do large transformations happen? And there is something very insightful that John Hegel told me. John Hegel is a very famous uh, technology is a leadership guru based in the Silicon Valley. He said, Firoz, here is one insight. All great transformations around the world have happened from the edges. They have never happened from the core. What always happens is that you do something at the edge, you make the edge grow so big that over a period of time, the core moves to the edge. People over and over again make the mistake of starting from the core. You start a transformation from the core, you will get killed because everybody will say, you are stupid, you are an idiot, you have no clue what you are talking about. And Autism at Work was a great example of doing something from the edge. It was not an HR project. It was not a project where we had a business plan. We just had an idea. We worked on that idea very subtly for a couple of years. And over a period of time, it became so big that now SAP adopted it, and now it's part of the code. I have nothing to do with the Autism at Work program today. I'm just an ambassador. I speak around the world about it. I have no control. I've given it up. That's how movements happen. They outlast you. But this is one significant insight about how large-scale transformations happen. A lot of CEOs, a lot of thought leaders make this mistake. They think, oh, you want to transform this company? You know what, give me a lot of money. I'm going to fight it out, and I'm going to fix this. Completely wrong. You can only do this if it's a founder-led company. Professional CEOs can't do that, not because they don't want to, but because the systems will not allow you to do it. And I would like to share a little bit about the Inclusion Summit, because there are some insights into that. And our mission, when we started the summit six years back, 
was to spread awareness about people with disabilities. That's the only mission. We are not there to you know, create jobs and all that. I said, you know, if we create awareness, which is the lowest common denominator, everything else falls in place. People are aware. Once people are aware, they are sensitive. Once they are sensitive, they act. But the lowest common denominator is awareness. And we looked around the world, and we found that there is not a single forum or an event where people spent two days talking about people with disabilities, even though it affects 60% of the world's population directly. Not single, not one event. You'll go to hundreds, and I go to probably every other event in the world, at least once I've been there. And there's not a single event which talks about inclusion and including people with disabilities, even though it affects 60% of the world's population. So we said, we'll start it ourselves. But the core mission is it should be fully inclusive, right? If it's not inclusive, then you know, it beats the purpose. So we said, what are the kinds of inclusion? There's financial inclusion, there is you know, all kinds of inclusion there. And we said, we will completely turn the tables around when it comes to the event. So we have four principles. First, it's an event which is fully free. So everybody can attend. So financially, we are included everybody. If it's free, everybody can come. Simple, right? It's completely free. The second thing, we have no organization. So it's 100% run by volunteers. 100%. People say, does this really work? I mean, who works for it? And you will show, you will see, and Raji will talk about it. If you are moved by purpose, everything else is secondary. Hundreds of volunteers spend their time to pull off this event. It's one of the largest inclusion events in the world, with 1,000 plus people attending and 500 to 1,000 people being on wait list two and a half months before the event has even happened. The first person every year I've seen this in the last six years comes at 7 a.m. for a 10 a.m. conference. For many of them, they say this is our annual pilgrimage because there is no such conference. And we do something absolutely out of the box. Our theme is no logos and no egos. And people say, how the hell does that work? Who would want to sponsor you? I said, we'll keep the purpose ahead of anything else. It's still sponsored by four corporates. We don't mention them anywhere. Because the purpose is the core of it. And all of them have come and said, Firoz, it's changed so much for us within the organization. We are seen as a compassionate company because we are with you. And that doesn't have to come by putting up any logos. It doesn't need to do it. People know it anyway. We did something very interesting. We used to raise funds a little bit so that the money can go to the fellowships, right? And we said, we'll stop it. So we used to call it a fundraising dinner. I said, everybody does that. We changed it to a friend-raising evening. We said, people will come, they can give what they want for a good cause, but we'll not ask anything. And science shows that when you don't ask, you get more. <laughs> That's how movements are done, large-scale movements. We have a very bold mission of you know, wanting to make India inclusive and the world inclusive. A lot of people think it's a stupid idea, but you know what? It's worth pursuing that. That, for me, is how change happens. And lastly, let me share this last anecdote. You know, me and my wife often have our conflicts. You know, she was, as I said, my classmate was actually much more brilliant than I was. She was way better than me because we were in the same class, so there was enough data to show that she was better than me. So, uh, <laughs> and she was with SAP for close to 10 years, but after my son was born, she gave up her career to take full time. But once in a while, she went back to work but she now realized that it's, it's important that she spend all her time taking care of my son. And I'm doing the easy stuff, traveling around the world, talking about stuff. This is easy. This is like vacation. <laughs> Honestly, this is vacation compared to what, you're, what my wife is doing at home. And a lot of times we have this you know, work-life balance. She said, I wish you had spent so much time with your son. It's much better. And I get this question for us, you know, how do you rate your work-life balance? I normally give myself B minus. My wife gives me D minus. <laughs> so, you know, we come from two different directions. Uh, at one point, she said something very powerful. I think we had a long chat, and she said, You know what, Firoz? Let's do the following You change the world for Vivan, I will change Vivan for the world. So, this is breaking a few myths. Please read this. The winner actually ran the 1500 meters race 1.7 seconds faster than the gold medal winner in 
the regular Olympics. Fourteen of the 27 Best Actor Awards since 1988, when Rain Man, Dustin Hoffman won the, uh, the, the Oscar for the Best Actor, has played the role of a person with disability. So if anybody says that there is nobody wants to listen to that story, completely wrong. What is very important is the statement below. I think Rajiv showed a glimpse of the video. Look at what he told. I am convinced that a leader's character is how he leads are intricately inter intervened. Who a person is in his professional capacity is simply who he is, and that person character shapes a company's culture for the better or the worse. Look at the heading. People started coddling autism as an advantage. You know, I met Temple Grandin, who's considered an icon. She says, jokingly, that 50% of the Silicon Valley is anyway autistic. <laughs> so isn't it an advantage? It is an advantage, right? This is a beautiful case study, and this is a completely... People don't believe this. It's actually better to be visually challenged if you are in Spain because you'll earn more and you will have the higher chance of getting a job. So if a system on a, or on a, on a systematic basis include people, you can change the narrative. That's my son. Isn't he good looking? I told you, right? I mean, <laughs> you all agree? I mean, yeah? Rajiv, I got one fact right. That's when he was, uh, just before he was diagnosed, uh, he's, that's how he is now. My wife takes all the credit for the looks, by the way. <laughs> this is how it all started. February 2011, we started with a simple workshop of inviting mothers to come and share their stories. And at the end of 2017, we have 127 people in 20 different positions in 10 countries, and we'll reach 650 by 2020. This is the Forbes story that went viral, which says how autistic scrammed at SAP. That's the first person we hired at SAP. She, you, you don't see her face now, because that's the first girl. We didn't want to uh, you know, publicly talk about her. This is the Harvard case study. This is fundamentally important. How to bring the core to the edge. John Hegel, I met him, and he said, this is how it works. He's done studies of hundreds of companies and transformations, and this is what he has to say. You have to design for inclusion. If you do smart design, things change, and we do a lot of these design principles in the Inclusion Summit that we do. One of the design principles, this is so important, is that 51% of the participants and the speakers have some kind of disability. And the reason for doing that is that anybody with a disability grows up in his entire lifetime being a minority. On that one day, we will make you a majority. And what amazing magic unfolds in the room. People who are normal started feeling that they are disabled. And the people with disabilities come with a lot of confidence because they are not a minority anymore. You change the context. You change the context, you change the narrative. This is my core belief. For large-scale changes, you need to have a team of teams. What does a team of team do? It's completely opposite of what happens in corporates. And what happens in corporate hierarchies? Decision-making is moved upwards. In a team of team, you push the decision-making downwards. I have thousands of volunteers. I'm just landing one day before the Inclusion Summit. I have no clue how it will work, but it works like magic because there are thousands of people who own the decision themselves. I don't tell them how to do it. That's how large-scale transformations happen. These are the takeaways. Lead from the edges, tap into the genius of the crowd. I think Rajiv spoke about crowds. Inclusion makes for compassionate leaders, design for inclusion, lead from behind. Thank you.